thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight, we have the distinct honor of hearing from one of our own, one of our alumni, Tali Winkler, the recently returned from Germany, Tali Winkler, um, who is going, there we go. Uh, the title of her talk tonight is Jews and the Plague in the Medieval and Early Modern Period. Um, thank you to the YP committee for all of the organization and everything that's enabled us to do this. Thank you to Reverend Itzarna for lending us the Zoom account. Um, I need to stop touching my eye. Um, <laughs> and with that, we're going to turn it over to Tali. Okay, hi everyone. Um, nice to see those of you who I could see. Uh, and see the names of people who I can. So I think we said we're going to keep everyone muted and if you have a question you can either like physically raise your hand or press the button that says raise hand and I will try to uh, uh, call on you. <laughs> um, okay so I think in general when I give shirim in this context, shir is like a little bit of a stretch because it's not exactly Torah, it's Jewish history, but I think that's fine. Um, so we're going to go for some Jewish history right now. Um, I thought it would be timely to talk about the Black Death. Uh, it's a little bit of a depressing topic, um, but I hope to at least end on a note of optimism, so just hang in there for that. Um, okay, so I'm sure most of you have heard of the Black Death or the bubonic plague. Um, it was one of the most devastating pandemics in human history. Um, it peaked in Europe between the years of 1347 and 1350. Um, it was caused by a bacterium called Yersinius Yersinia pestis, um, and it killed an estimated 75 to 200 million people in Europe and Asia. Um, and that 30, between 30 and 60 percent of Europe's population was killed, um, with a lot of variation depending on urban density um, and different locations. Um, and just the magnitude of that, you have to basically restructure society when you lose half the population. Like, you lose a lot of knowledge and skills that the society had been depending on until that point. Um, so it was a very traumatic experience for like the entire continent of Europe. Um, so it was called the bubonic plague because there are these um, bubos or like inflamed lymph nodes that were um, like a hallmark of the disease. Um, so there was this initial outbreak in the middle of the 14th century, um, but for the next 300 years there were constant smaller outbreaks throughout Europe. Um, factors like famine or war could increase the severity of an outbreak, but they just happened all the time for the next three centuries. Um, and some were like on relatively large scales, although not like that first initial wave. For example, in 1466, around 40,000 people died in Paris. Um, and the plague occurred in Venice 22 times between the years 1361 and 1528. So just, it, it just was constantly, uh, there were constant outbreaks of, this, of the plague. Um, so medicine at this time was still based on classical sources. So like the germ theory of transmission was like not a thing. They didn't really have a concept of bacteria uh, or hygiene. So doctors really had no idea what was causing this disease. Um, the most widely accepted idea was that it was caused by like bad air, that the air was poisoned and that could create an imbalance in, the, in a person's bodily humors. Um, so in the 17th century, doctors would uh, doctors who were treating patients of, who had the plague would wear this plague mask, um, which you can see in source number one. It kind of looks like a bird's mask. And the idea behind that is that they would fill it with herbs and flowers, and they thought that the good air, like the sweet smelling air, would kind of counteract the poisoned bad air and prevent them from getting the plague. Um, so that is not true, but it actually was slightly effective for doctors. Um, because there are two, way, two main ways that you could catch the plague. One is through bodily fluids of someone who was infected, and the death rate was like around 40% if you caught it that way. Um, and if, but if you inhaled it, then you got pneumatic plague, and the death rate was like almost 100%. So these masks, while it wasn't the flowers that were helpful, the fact that they were wearing masks meant that the doctors who were examining the patients wouldn't inhale the bacteria and then they wouldn't get this more severe form of the plague and die automatically. Um, so it was helpful in, in a way that they didn't think it was helpful. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so because there wasn't such a good explanation for the Black Death, often people would look for other places to, put, to place the blame. Um, and often the Jews were blamed for that. And they were accused of poisoning the wells and various Jews were arrested and like tortured until they confessed and, and named other Jews. Um, and there were massacres all over Europe in the years 1348 to 1350 um, in response to these accusations, especially in Spain and Germany. Um, so this was, I think, in a combination, uh, because of a combination of multiple factors, um, anti-Semitism, fear of the plague, and also an economic resentment um, by craftsmen who saw the Jews as competition or nobles who owed the Jews money. Um, so this was like kind of a good excuse. Um, so source number two is, so, so I'm bringing a bunch of primary sources oh. there. Yeah, Alana. Is it being recorded? I know we wanted to record it for a community. Yes. Okay. Hopefully that it'll work and like the file will be normal. Great. But, <laughs> like sendable. But we'll Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we'll, we'll go through a couple of uh, primary sources now from that this early period of the initial outbreak and then we'll talk about some later sources from like the later recurrent outbreaks of the plague. So and um, this first source, source number, or second source, I guess, source number two, um, is um, a, an account from the church of uh, one of these Jews who was tortured until he confessed to doing something. Um, so if you turn to page two of the source sheet, I have a part that's in bold that I'm going to read. Um, if someone wants to read, they're welcome to, but it might be easier if I just do it. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, the, the name of the Jew in this case is, <clears throat> sorry, is Agamet. I don't know what kind of name that is. Um, so he says, when this came to the notice of Rabbi Peyret, a Jew of Chambury, who was a teacher of their law, he sent for this Agamet for whom he had searched. And when he had come before him, he said, we've been informed that you are going to Venice to buy silk and other wares. Here I am giving you a little package of half a span in size, which contains some prepared poison and venom in a thin sewed leather bag distributed among the wells, cisterns, and springs about Venice and the other places to which you go, in order to poison the people who use the water of the aforesaid wells that will have been poisoned by you, namely the wells at which the poison have, will have been placed. Agamet took this package full of poison and carried it with him to Venice, and when he came there, he threw and scattered a portion of it into the well or cistern of fresh water, which was there near the German house, in order to poison the people uh, who use the water of that cistern. And he says that this is the only cistern of sweet water in the city. He also says that the mentioned Rabbi Peyret promised to give him whatever he wanted for his troubles in this business. Of his own accord, as opposed to under torture, I think, um, although probably still under torture, um, he confessed further that after this had been done, he left at once in order that he should not be captured by the citizens or others. And then he went personally to Calabria and Apulia and threw the above mentioned poison into many wells. He confesses also that he put some of the same poison into the wall of the streets of the city of Ballet. Um, so this is, uh, again, this is an account of, like the church's account of a Jew who confessed uh, to these things under torture. And these reports were then like sent all over the place to cities. Um, and that would often cause these like mobs to go and um, attack the Jews in Jewish quarter. Um, okay, so. Anyone have any questions on this source before I move on to source number three? Okay. <laughs> um, so source number three is an account of the uh, massacre of the Jews in Strasbourg. Sorry. Um, so this is from a chronicle that was written relatively contemporaneously. Um, and... Um, yeah, so this happened in February 1349, um, and the first part, which we'll skip, explains how the city authorities uh, heard these reports that the Jews had poisoned the wells, um, but they were not really interested in blaming the Jews or harming them, but they were essentially overruled by the residents of the city. Like, the, that city council was, like, kind of dismissed, and a new one was appointed, who then gave the uh, city members, like, permission to go ahead with the... Uh, uh, mob against the Jews. Um, so if you skip to, again, I, I brought all of these sources uh, 
in I, I like I brought larger chunks of the sources because I think they're very interesting. And if you are interested after and have more time, you should feel free and encouraged to read through all of them. And um, we're going to read like a couple of the limited uh, excerpts just so we can get a sense of what was going on. But they're very interesting sources. <laughs> um, okay, so if we turn to page four of the source sheet again, I tried to bold the parts that we're actually going to uh, do. Um, so the bolded part on page four. Um, on Saturday, that was St. Valentine's Day, they burned the Jews on a wooden platform in their cemetery. There were about 2,000 people of them. Those who wanted to baptize themselves were spared. Um, some say that about 1,000 accepted baptism. Many small children were taken out of the fire and baptized against the will of their fathers and mothers. Everything that was owed to the Jews was canceled, and the Jews had to surrender all pledges and notes that they had taken for debts. The council, however, took the cash that the Jews possessed and divided it among the working men proportionately. The money was indeed the thing that killed the Jews. If they had been poor, and if the feudal lords had not been in debt to them, they would not have been burnt. Uh, after this wealth was divided among the artisans, some gave their share to the cathedral or to the church on the advice of their confessors. Um, so I think it's interesting here to see that this Christian contemporaneous report, even they uh, acknowledge that there was like a very clear financial motivation behind the violence against the Jews here. Um, yeah, so this was just uh, one example, um, but this happened all over Europe, um, especially, like I said, in, in Germany and uh, in uh, Spain. Um, so the Pope heard about all these massacres against the Jews, and he was very much against them. Um, I think he probably didn't think the Jews were behind this, and also uh, it was good for him, for the Jews to keep living so they could keep paying taxes. Um, so there was certainly also a financial motivation uh, on that end. Um, so if you look at source number four, um, which is at the bottom of page four and then on page five, so the Pope put out a papal bull to tell local authorities to protect their Jews um, and not let these, um, these mobs and massacres happen. Um, so again, I'll just read some of the bulls, so that's on page five. Uh, recently, however, it has come to our attention by public fame, or rather infamy, that some Christians out of rashness have impiously slain several of the Jews without respect to age or sex, after falsely blaming the pestilence on poisonings by Jews, said to be in league with the devil, when in fact it is the result of an angry God striking at the Christian people for their sins. And it is the assertion of many that some of these Christians are chasing after their own profit and are blinded by greed in getting rid of the Jews because they owe them great sum, owe great sums of money to them. And skipping again to the bold. And although we would wish that the Jews be suitably and severely punished, should perchance they be guilty of or accessories to such an outrageous crime, for which any penalty that could be devised would barely be sufficient. Nevertheless, it does not seem credible that the Jews are on this occasion responsible for the crime, nor that they caused it, because this nearly universal pestilence, in accordance with God's hidden judgment, has afflicted and continues to afflict the Jews themselves, as well as many other races who had never been known to live alongside them throughout the various regions of the world. Um, so I think this uh, it's, it's a very interesting statement by the Pope, I think, and one of the reasons that he brings as like proof that the Jews weren't behind uh, this pestilence that's breaking out is that Jews are also getting sick and dying. Like they wouldn't do this to themselves. Um, I think the, it, there's a claim that's often um, said in like modern times, I think often by Jews trying to like make themselves sound better that like the, the death rate of the Jews was lower because they have all these hygienic practices like mikvah. Um, I'm not convinced that that's true. Um, I think the death rate varied very much between cities, and in some cities the death rate of Jews was lower, and in some cities the death rate of Jews was higher because they lived in like these awful conditions because uh, they weren't allowed to live in most of the city. So I think it just really depended, and I am a little bit skeptical of the fact of like this claim that like mikvah saved the Jews from the plague. Um, and in this case, again, the Pope is saying don't kill the Jews, they're not responsible, they're also dying, um, which I think is like a very uh, compelling <laughs> proof on his part. Um, yeah, okay, so this didn't really work though, people still kept massacring Jews for the next like year or two. Um, 
after the year 1350, it kind of died down. Um, a lot of major cities throughout Western Europe expelled their Jews within the next 150 years, some like immediately after the plague, some a little bit later. Um, so there was, by the end of that period, a little bit of a shift towards uh, Eastern Europe, but even within Western Europe, there were still Jews there, but they would live in like rural, like a couple of Jewish families per village instead of having like an urban center. Um, so that had like various ramifications for the structure of Jewish communities and like access to resources like cemeteries and rabbis. Um, but that's a little bit of a separate story. Okay. Um, any questions about that so far? Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so source number five is the last contemporary source that we will look at. Um, we're not really going to read it inside, but I did give you the full text as, long, as well as an English translation. Um, so this is a kina written in the 14th century by someone in Spain. Um, it's not 100% clear that it was written in the aftermath of this initial outbreak of the plague, but for various reasons, scholars have said that they think it is. Um, the, the description involves like both uh, intense illness and intense violence against the Jews. So this seems like a good candidate for when, when it's talking about. Um, so this, uh, by, by writing this, uh, writing about this event in Akina, I think this is a genre that we're very familiar with um, because this is one way in which Jews throughout history have contextualized what's happening to them by using this genre of keynote and saying, what we're experiencing now, really that's a part of Jewish history and it's, it fits into this narrative that we know and we're familiar with. Um, it, almost as if it's like what you're going through right now is a continuation of biblical history. It, it's cyclical, this is nothing new, this is something that we know and we're familiar with. Um, they did not, or at least this author, um, did not see the Black Plague as something uh, completely new or different. It's not an unprecedented historical event. This is another outbreak of an illness that's killing a bunch of people. It's another outbreak of like a pogrom against the Jews and it's something that like they have, that happens sometimes. Um, but, but at least this author did not see it as something unprecedented. It could be that he didn't really know the scope of the devastation throughout the continent. Um, so, yeah, so feel free to ruse at your leisure, as we say in our shul. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I gave the English and Hebrew. Okay. So now we're going to move on to later outbreaks of the plague. Um, this is more my period, and there's more fun sources surviving from this period, so I like these sources better. <laughs> um, so the first one is from the autobiography of Leon Modena, who is a Venetian rabbi um, who lived from 1571 to 1648. Um, he's very interesting because we have a lot of information about him. Um, he wrote an autobiography where he was very honest about his life struggles and his like very troubled relationship with various family members. Um, and so he tells about a lot of like personal and professional struggles. He actually struggled with gambling for uh, much of his life and went into debt a couple times because he like couldn't stay away from gambling. Um, and he talks about this a lot. But we also know from other sources from the archives um, that he was an incredibly successful rabbi and intellectual. Um, he was a very popular preacher and often Christian dignitaries would visit his synagogue to listen to him deliver his sermon because he was such a compelling speaker. Um, he wrote various works in Hebrew and he wrote poetry in Italian for his Christian patrons. So he was like a very interesting character. Um, so there was an outbreak of the plague in Venice in 1630, 1631, and he writes about this in his autobiography. Um, and during this outbreak of the plague, he wrote and sold amulets to protect people from the plague. Um, and these amulets contained a prayer based on the divine name, which he said he'd learned in a dream in which he saw prophets who like told him about this special divine name that he should put in amulets. Um, and according to an account by his grandson, he was wont to say that any house that had an amulet that he wrote, no one died from the plague. Um, I don't know if that's true, but it's fine. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll read an excerpt of this. So we're on page eight of the source sheet now. Um, 
Okay, so again, he like gives a little bit of background. He says like the individuals in the ghetto in Venice that the plague started with and then like spread out from there. Um, so that's definitely interesting that they had this sense of like a starting point and then it, uh, I don't know. They definitely didn't have like germ theory yet. So they don't have the same sense of like contagion that we have, but um, there's this sense of like who it starts with and exactly when it happened during the game, Noraim, fine. Um, okay, so between the beginning, I'm in the bolded part on page eight. Between the beginning of the month of Adarshini, March, which started March 5th, uh, 1631, and the 11th of Sivan, June 12th, 1631, um, even though the pestilence had increased in severity in every quarter of the city, God made a wondrous division between their camp and the camp of Israel, and nobody became ill or died in the two ghettos, because Venice had two separate ghettos that were both the Jews were just like connected by a bridge, which is still true if you go visit there. But don't do that now. Um, <laughs> the Gentiles were astonished at this wondrous thing. Only we Jews did not appreciate the miracle wrought for us, and people in our communities continued to do evil in the sight of God by quarreling, slandering, stealing, cursing, lying, and swearing falsely. Thus God's anger was kindled against his people, and they began to be afflicted by the plague on the 11th of Sivan. He did not relent and heal them, however, and once again, many people began to die in both ghettos. Nonetheless, the death toll among the Jews never reached the mortality in the rest of the city. It was not so in the communities of Verona and Padua, for God's hand struck them, and less than one-third survived. No one escaped, for there was not a house without its dead, which is a um, Makat the wrote, right, ten plagues reference. Um, May the merciful one have pity on his creatures. Um, then, as mentioned before, the plague continued in the city and among the Jews through Cheshvan 50, uh, in 1631. Then God, in his great mercy, took pity, and the bitterness of death was turned away. There was great celebration in the city, and everyone gave thanks to his God. In addition, a fast was decreed in all the holy congregations for the eve, um, Tuesday evening, November 25th, 1631, of the new moon of Kislev with a prayer service for the new moon during the day, including the prayer Nishmat Kol Chai, and with pleasant sounds of joyfulness. A collection was taken up in every synagogue, which will be used to make a silver object to commemorate the deliverance. Blessed is he who redeems and saves, blessed is he and blessed is his name. Um, so I think there's two things that really struck me with the way that he describes this outbreak. First is the extent to which this is from God. Um, and that was pretty widespread of a way of thinking about this among Christians and Jews, especially because they didn't have a sense of bacteria, uh, germs spreading. Um, this must be from God because of our sins, right? So at first, God spared the Jews, but then we continued sinning. So then God no longer spared us and we also deserve punishment. Um, and again, I think that was a pretty common way of understanding misfortune in general, but especially outbreaks of illness. Uh, in this period. Um, and I think also the um, celebration that was uh, mandated at the end, once this outbreak had ended, um, is also very interesting that they're, they collected money from everyone and they're using it to make a silver object to commemorate it, um, which is so fascinating that, fascinating that in addition to any liturgical um, uh, memorialization that we're familiar with of keynote and also like uh, these local poems that communities who like got saved miraculously would celebrate their own personal local poem. Um, here they're they're making a, an object that would sit in the synagogue as like a permanent and material physical commemoration of God saving them from the plague. And again it's not that, they, that no one died, it's that people stopped dying, right? They're still able to uh, acknowledge that there was a plague and people died, but the fact that people stopped dying, that's really worthy of celebration. Um, so that was like a very uh, compelling description as an example of like how a person would live through the experience of uh, a, a plague that comes through and destroys things and then leaves. Um, yeah, okay, so I thought that was interesting. Okay, um, next source is from Gluckle of Hamel, who I've spoken about before in my previous talks because I really like her. <laughs> um, so she was a businesswoman 
um, who lived from 1645 to 1724. Um, and we know a lot about her life because after her husband died to make herself feel better, she wrote like this diary or autobiography where she tells a bit about the history of her family um, and her experience after her husband dies. And she had 14 kids, two of whom uh, died before she did. But then when her husband died, eight of her children were still unmarried and she had to like keep up her husband's business to fund their dowries and, and make them matches, whatever. So, so it's just a very interesting um, and, and really unique description of daily life of a Jewish woman who lived in Germany uh, in the late 17th, early 18th century. So there's lots of amazing material in her autobiography. Um, so I highly recommend that if you have some free time these days, uh, check it out, read it. It's a great book. <laughs> um, so I attached in the back a bunch of pages about a, this specific story that I'm going to tell. We're not going to read the whole thing because it's like eight pages long or something. Um, so we'll just read excerpts, but I'll summarize what happened. So um, they were living in Hamburg, her and her husband, and I don't, I think only three kids at that time. Um, and they, there's an outbreak of the plague in Hamburg. So they want to get out. They want to go elsewhere. So they travel to Hanover because um, they have family members there who can put them up uh, while there's this plague going on in uh, Hamburg. So they go there and they get there right before Sukkot and they're going to spend the holiday with family members there. Um, and on the first day of Sukkot, while her husband's at Shul, she's getting her daughter dressed and she notices that her four-year-old daughter has like a sore under her arm. And remember that uh, these uh, enlarged lymph nodes are a sign of, of the plague. Um, but, sh but also the, these things happen. So she sees it and like doesn't get freaked out. She doesn't think that her daughter has the plague. So she sends her maid into shul to ask her husband for the recommendation of like a, she, uh, like a barber slash surgeon. It's like this wasn't a very, this type of medical procedure, you don't go to a doctor, you go to a barber. And he also like, will put plaster on your wound and bandage it up. Like just the division of labor was different, I guess. Um, so she sends the maiden to ask the husband where they should bring the daughter to, to, to bandage up her, her uh, little lymph node thing. Um, but this process, when the maid goes in and asks the question, sparks complete panic in the shul because everyone knows that they just came from Hamburg where there's an outbreak of the plague. And now this girl has this like postural thing that, that they don't know what it is. Um, okay, so... So this woman from the shul who says she's a healer says, oh, I'll go and check her out. She goes and looks at it. Um, so now I'm on page 109 in the um, attached, in like the glickle pages. Um, I think I gave starting at 106, but it's highlighted in yellow. Um, so I'm just going to read it part because I think just the way that she speaks is like so uh, like human and dramatic. So I think it's like worth it to at least read a small excerpt. Um, okay, so the Glickle, the mother, like, has no reason to suspect anything. So the woman says, like, sure. She says, can I look at it? And, and Glickle's like, sure. So she examines the little girl, then dashes away from her back upstairs to the women, causing panic among them, and tells the women, run away, all of you who can flee, for you have, alas, the genuine plague in the house. The little girl has the genuine pestilence, heaven for friends. Well, easy to imagine the commotion and screaming among the women, especially such big cowards. Men and women all left the synagogue at a run, right in the middle of the most important prayers in the holy festival day, mercy upon us. Hastily, they thrust the maid and the little girl out the door. No one wanted them in the house, and they would not let them inside. It's easy to understand how we felt. I kept crying and screaming, begging in God's name, my friends, think twice of what you are doing. My daughter has nothing wrong with her. You can see for yourself that my daughter is healthy and well, thank God. The girl had a head cold with runny nose, poor thing. Before leaving Hamburg, I applied some ointment, and it went from her head to the sore. When you catch something like this, God forbid, this meaning the plague, you get ten different symptoms. Just look, my child is running around in the street eating a roll. But all to no avail. If this gets out, they said, and His Excellency the Duke hears that there is such a thing in the city, God forbid, what a catastrophe it will be. 
Um, so again, this is like dramatic confrontational scene of like, they're like throwing out the daughter and the maid and she's like begging them like, no, my child's healthy. Um, and it seems like they have two main concerns. One is that it'll spread the plague to other people in shul. And second is that the Duke will find out that Jews brought the plague into the city. And that would be a disaster. In addition to any death that would happen from the plague, like it's a really bad idea for Jews to be responsible for bringing the plague into a city. Um, so they, everyone needs to decide what to do. And they decide that they'll send the maid and the four-year-old girl to like a nearby village that's within Tchum Shabbat. Don't worry, even though, even though it's Chag, it's okay. Um, and they'll dress them in rags and tell them to say that they're beggars and the Jewish community turned them away because there were already too many beggars there. So we just need to stay for the holiday. And the Jews said, they'll send us kosher food and we have money that we can pay you. Don't worry, like we just need somewhere to stay for the rest of the holiday. Um, so that's what they decide to do. Um, and they need someone though to escort the maid and the daughter and two people volunteer, but they demand to be paid, but it's Chag. And like they won't go without getting money because it's like too big or risky of a job. So they have another meeting and they say, the rabbis decide like, okay, fine, this is pikuach nefesh. Like you can pay them money on Chag to take the maid and the daughter to the, to the nearby village. Like that's allowed. This is, this is pikuach nefesh. This is worth it. Um, yeah, so um, I guess I'll skip the next one. Um, and Glickel is like hysterical as this is happening. She compares herself to Avraham and Akedat Yitzchak as she sees her daughter being led away, but that she, that Avraham was able to be happy about it because he was fulfilling the word of God and she was not able to be happy about it. Um, so in the end, the, um, they gave them the money, they brought them over to the village, they stayed there until Shmini Atzeret, and the kid was healthy. So Gluckel said, like, you see, she's healthy, like, let her back in. And they're like, no, we still can't do it. And then finally, in Simchat Torah, they, like, allowed them to, like, walk over to the other village and bring them over, and it was, like, a huge celebration. She was so happy to have her child back. Um, and again, like, the, the rest of the account here is, like, really fun to read, so I encourage you to read the rest of the, like, eight pages that we're not reading together now, but it's a really fun um, account. Um, anyway, I think this is, again, like, just a, a really um, raw and human description of, like, what was involved in going through a suspected outbreak of the plague and what the factors were that were, that were involved and what the emotions were that were involved. Um, She's like a very honest narrator. Um, and just the way that she describes the, the reactions of people and her reactions, um, the plague was a reality. Like this was not an abstract threat. They were running away from the plague. That's why they were in uh, Hanover in the first place. Um, but luckily for her, in this case, her daughter did not have the plague and everything was fine. <laughs> um, okay, so. That was the two autobiographies. Um, okay, put those away. Too many pages. Okay. Um, so now, um, last genre of sources that we're going to look at are prayers. Um, often, specific prayers would be composed um, by individual communities in response to an outbreak of the plague. Um, sometimes they were more general, but often they were specific to a community. Um, based on an outbreak that was happening right now, and they would be added to the local liturgy. Um, so source number eight is an example of this. Um, so this is a, so in the, like the image, I put like two small blue lines, which is the part that's actually excerpted here, but it's like kind of, it's hard Italian handwriting to read. So there's a transcription and translation. So the image is just more for fun. Um, so yeah, so, so I'll read the, it's pretty short, so I'll read it in Hebrew and then in English. Um, so this is the prayer in, uh, for the specific uh, outbreak of the plague in the specific community. So Right, so may it be your will, the faithful God, Father of mercy, that you should redeem and save the faithful Israel wherever they are from the destroying angel. Um, and that's often like a way of talking about illness that is breaking out among people. 
ובפרט הפליך צדיך על אחינו קהל קדוש קורג'יו, אשר זה כמה ימים נטמע בהם יד השם, והוכו בכמה מיני חולאים, והרבה מהם מתו. Um, and especially, and specifically, I wasn't really sure what Hafle was doing there, but deploy, so, something like that, like give them uh, your kindness upon our brothers, the holy community of Correggio, who these last few days, the hand of God has taken revenge upon them. And they were afflicted with multiple different illnesses, and many among them died. Um, and let the verse be fulfilled with them, take the best of the flock. So I think they're probably um, saying, may the best of the flock already have been taken, like anyone who died, that's enough. And that's like not the shot of the, of the Pasuk, but I think they're like uh, taking a Midrashic read on the Pasuk, but I'm not totally sure. Um, but the hand of your attribute of justice is still outstretched upon them. Right, so this was being written in the middle of an outbreak of the plague and saying, God, please stop this current outbreak. Um, this, this kind of type of prayer would not have been, it would have only been said until the end of the outbreak. It's not something that, like a kina that would have been like added to a Tisha B'Av liturgy or something like that. This is like a very local specific um, prayer. Um, so that's one example. And then source nine, uh, which is the last example, last source I mean. Um, so this was a prayer that was commissioned by Rabbi David Oppenheim, who was the chief rabbi of Prague. He's also very, uh, interesting character. He was one of these like court Jews who had a lot of connections to various um, Christian rulers. He had a huge book collection, which became the basis of the uh, Hebrew book collection in Oxford at the Bodleian. Um, there's a new book out about him and his uh, work as a book collector and like politician almost, and like as a leader of the Jewish community and the connections he had by Josh Plitsky. I highly recommend it. Check it out if you want. Um, so this is an image that I took from his book. Um, oh, I didn't put that down. Sorry about that. Um, so this was a prayer that he commissioned during an outbreak of the plague in Prague um, in 1713. So if you look at it, first of all, it was printed, right? So this is um, at a point where the printing press was very active, uh, right? Pr the printing press was uh, invented around 1450. Jews started printing books around 1469, and it spread very rapidly after that. Um, and prayer books were one of the most commonly printed Jewish or Hebrew books because they were so frequently used, and then they would get like overused, and you'd need to get a new one because the pages are falling out. We know how that works. Um, so this was an example of a specific prayer commissioned by the chief rabbi, uh, David Oppenheim, and you can see the acrostics, it's like a bunch of pays and then a bunch of reishes, a bunch of gimels and a bunch of olives that spells out Prague, the way that you spell Prague in Hebrew. Um, so again, this was very specific to the outbreak in Prague in 1713. He himself did not stay in the city for the outbreak. Like other wealthy people, he fled to, to like the country because he had a place to go and um, that would be less dangerous than the urban center. Um, but he was someone who liked documenting things and it was important to him to, first of all, write this prayer for the people of Prague and also to make sure that he had a copy of it in his book collection and he would be able to keep a record of what happened in the city. And he even included in his collection um, like accounts that were mad at him for leaving the city. He like wanted to document what happened. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so that's the end of the sources for now. Um, this was just a sampling of Jewish responses to the plague, like what happened to them and how they themselves reacted. Um, it's not representative necessarily. There's, I just, my shirim are usually finding interesting historical sources and sharing them. Um, so yeah, so to end on my note of optimism, and then I'll, uh, if anyone has any questions, um, my shirim generally don't come with like inspirational or practical notes or lessons. Um, but one thing that often um, occurs to me as I'm studying these periods is a gratitude that I don't live in the pre-modern period as a Jew or as a woman or as a human being who benefits from the medical advances that society has uh, had in the last couple hundred years. Um, 
So we are obviously in a very scary and stressful and uncertain time right now. I'm not trying to minimize that, but uh, it's nice every once in a while to feel a little bit of gratitude that we don't live in medieval or early modern times. Um, and sometimes that gratitude can a little bit alleviate some of the anxiety that comes with uncertain times like this. So I hope the survey, while it was also somewhat depressing, can also give you a little bit of a sense of gratitude as well. That was awesome. Thanks for the question. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody has questions, uh, feel free to unmute, unmute yourself. Um, I saw that we had one from the comments, or from the little chat here. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm seeing some questions here. Okay, so one question I see is Makapehoro and uh, Golden Calf, should we read anything into this? So on the one hand, I definitely think that the reference to Makapahoro is very, uh, it's on purpose. It's a reference to a plague that's described in the Bible that is like from God and involves a lot of death. Um, so that's definitely, I think, a conscious choice. Um, in general, Jews in these periods use a ton of biblical references. So like um, the quote from Yechazkel, like I didn't really look at the context so much, but like that was just one that was very explicit in the in the prayer from Italy, but like in the description that Leon Modena was using to describe his experience, in addition to um, the, this obvious one of the 10 plagues, there were like references to Yonah and Eov, um, there's like a lot of different, maybe not Yonah, I forget, whatever, there's like a bunch of different um, references that are just, that's how people spoke, like that was the rabbinic language, and again, there was the sense that like, the Bible has so much of the Jewish experience in it, so you might as well reference that because it's like a, a a book, like a text, but also an experience that everyone knows and is familiar with and like spans across Jewish history and Jewish geography. Um, so I think that was definitely uh, conscious, but also um, just there's like a, a lot more biblical references that we didn't even talk about, just that was like a relevant one, so I pointed it out. Um, Okay, I had another, I got another chatted question. If you have any extra time, can you talk about types of knowledge that were lost because of the plague? Um, so, so I, I'm not sure I have a very good example. I know like with the two things I'll say, one is like the labor structure of Europe was changed a lot because there was such a lack of population. Um, so like wages went up, for example, because laborers were so much more in demand because there were no longer as many people. Um, and a bunch of settlements just like disappeared because they didn't have enough enough people to sustain them anymore. Um, I know in the context of like the fall of the Roman Empire, which was like a thousand years before that, that like just the lack of structure and unity in society meant that like the roads were more dangerous because there weren't enough people to police them. And then like you couldn't import things as well. So like, um, certain recipes for making like concrete or something if you needed to import the type of stone so like you couldn't uh get access to that so like i guess you could make your son memorize the formula and his son i guess could make his son memorize the formula, formula but eventually if you don't regain access to that resource you're going to lose that uh knowledge of how to make those types of um these like recipes and other stuff like that um so again, like that, that's not the right period. That example is not from the right period, but I would imagine that it's something similar that like, um, I don't know, like guilds now have like half as many people or if like in a certain city, the death rate was like 75% and like an entire guild was wiped out. Um, I think just like the, the number of people who were in charge of certain things in a city, like if they're just not there anymore, um, they, like you have to totally restructure how your city is run. Not the best answer to your question, I'm sorry. Uh, so Renana here, I guess I have maybe more of a comment than a question, um, but in among the kind of various random research I've done in my academic wanderings, um, I've studied a lot about Venetian architecture and Venetian plague art, um, and the Christians in Venice were also very much uh, making churches and art in devotion for the end of the plague, and in particular for the plague that you mentioned in 1630, 
um, one of the most famous churches in Venice, uh, Santa Maria della Salute, was dedicated. So I imagine that what you were seeing in that source is the same tradition and like fascinating to think that the Jews in Venice were doing the same sort of devotional um, art making uh, based on the plague as the Christians. Yeah, definitely true. I don't think that anything we see that we saw here is necessarily unique to Jews. I think a lot of the ways that they reacted to things around them it was similar to the people who they lived around. But that's just how you react to something like the plague. Um, and that they thought that it was from God, so did the Christians. Like when it stopped, they thanked God, and so did the Christians. I think that was like a pretty universal um, approach or like reaction to misfortune in this way. So yes, thank you for adding that because you probably know a lot more about Venetian church architecture than I do. So. <laughs> um, this is Orly, Tali's sister. <laughs> um, question. <coughs> so I know you mentioned like amulets. And uh, I know in general that there are a lot of a lot more superstitions in that era. Are there any notable or interesting superstitions, like Jewish ones, either just in general that you know about, or any ones that I don't know have carried over to today? I know that there's a thing. Yeah, probably not that. But any interesting superstitions that you learned about or read about? Um, not that I can remember specifically. Um, there definitely are amulets that. I think amulets were very common in general, um, which is something that's not really a part of our religion today. So it's a little bit hard for us to relate to. Like they had amulets for women giving birth. They would make sure to be in the room during labor that would protect them. Um, there were amulets that you'd put next to the crib so that Lilith doesn't kidnap your kid um, before the bris. There's like all these um, areas of danger that like because they had no way, like they didn't have medicine. Uh, Yes, animals and a half stuff sound like me. Definitely true. <laughs> um, they didn't have ways to like make sure that you live through labor, so they make an amulet for it, and like that uh, is one way to do it. So they would. Um, I saw. I think I forget if it's like the National Library of Israel. Maybe they posted today a book that had a printed amulet to protect against the plague. Um, that it was again. It was printed in a Kabbalistic book, and I guess you were supposed to like cut it out and hang it up in your. <laughs> And that was just like a part of life that you had amulets everywhere because you believed in the power of amulets and you believed in angels and demons who had a, pow a power over you and over your life. Um, I, d I don't know the history of a yacht amulet, that specific shape. I, yeah, I don't know. But, but in general, I think amulets were a very, very common part of life. I don't know any specific uh, things about the plague, sorry. Um, wait, there was another question here. Effect on Jewish literature. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think it, it, I guess I'm not entirely sure what you mean by Jewish literature. Um, Meaning, like, my understanding of, like, the history of Halakha and Ashkenaz is that basically, like, it died during the plague and then was, like, brought back by the Roma. Um, it seems like a pretty substantial effect on... Yeah, so I think in, in 1848 to 50, um, many of the communities that were like totally destroyed were in the Rhineland, right, which had been centers of halachic thought and development until that point. Um, so that was certainly a dramatic effect. Um, and I think also in Spain, like 1348 to 1350, there were these major outbreaks of pogroms. Um, in 1391, there was like a big pogrom again it caused a wave of conversions and like that led almost directly to the expulsion in 1492 um, and like the loss of Spain as a Jewish center both intellectually and like population wise um, but yeah I think there uh, there is definitely a big effect on Jewish literature halakhic literature um, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know as much about that so I'm gonna not give any more information about that <laughs> And did I miss any other questions? I think just talking about Mrs. Odin's fill in his amulets, which, yeah, <laughs> they kind of are. <laughs> I think I think one way that Mrs. Odin, and I'll get, Carly, I'll get to you in a second, one way that people um, 
kind of do still have this like amulety aspect in their life now is like you hear these people who like um if you're sick you should check all your muses out to make sure they're all kosher right and that's like something that like we've all heard before and like know people who've done that and i think that definitely reflects the sense of like the magical properties of this text with god's name in it that again is like not usually how we live most of our religious life but it's like still here a little bit, but I think it was much, much more present in that period. Um, Carly. Hi, first of all, thank you. Um, question. So with regards to one of the plagues you talked about, you said there was a celebration in Cheshvan when it was over. My question is, is I'm thinking of Rabbi Akiva and when he had the plague and lost all of his students. And to this day, we celebrate Lagba Omer. How come we don't celebrate more ending of plagues when Clearly, they had a celebration at the time. Why is it that Lagwa Omer carried over, but none of the other ones did? Um, yeah, so definitely a good point that there is this tradition of like commemorating the end of a bad thing. Um, I think probably because these were all so local, they didn't get adopted in, in like a larger, more universal way. Um, I think Purim is also the, fo kind of follows that model where like, something bad was happening and then like it it was resolved and we have a Purim. Um, so like, it's a little bit different because like no one actually died and like we actually killed a lot of non-Jews, but fine. Um, but I think that was usually more the model that Jewish communities looked to than Rabbi Akiva to celebrate them being saved from danger. So like I mentioned before, you have all of these very local Purims where a community was like, either expelled or about to be expelled and then like they petitioned to the emperor and he intervened and then they were allowed to stay and they'll establish a local Purim for that specific community like Frankfurt um, and they um, celebrate it on that on the day that it happened and it's, it's a very local celebration. Um, I even actually encountered a manuscript recently of a family that had a local familial Purim where the like patriarch of the family whatever he went through a hard time he was accused of doing um of like all these like awful business practices and he was arrested and like his money was confiscated and then eventually he like got out of jail after five years and he establishes a, a personal purim for his family and he writes like a 20 page uh manuscript in yiddish describing what happened to him and to, like addressed to his son and saying you and all future generations should celebrate this Purim be, as, to commemorate the fact that I was saved from all my misfortune. Um, so I think that the Purim model was much more common than the like Lagba Omer model, but I think that it reflects a similar approach of like acknowledging that there was some type of salvation. Just in the plague one, there was also a bunch of more bad stuff that happened before. <laughs> That also reminds me, it sounds a little bit um, like how the Chabad community celebrates days that the Rebbe got out of jail. Yeah, as, sure. As communal holidays. Yeah, totally. But again, that's like local to Chabad because their leader. Yeah. Right. Um, so like local in a more modern sense. Uh, of... In that it's celebrated more globally, but it's still limited to a very specific community. <laughs> yeah. If anyone thinks of um, other questions, you're welcome to email me or whatever. So I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, how is it, you know, Related that in the past they used to blame the Jews for the they were you, you were talking about how they were blaming the Jews for the pandemia, mm -hmm. and how does that relate to the world today? Because I don't know if any of you received the emails from Honest Reporting, but on Honest Reporting they are talking about how some people are saying that this is the Jews trying to get this flag, trying to eliminate the Palestinian, you know, the Arab people, or something like that. So it would be interesting to know that correlation from then. I, I'm assuming it all comes it stems from that time frame, but to understand, you know, how does it really relate to us today? So it's definitely a good, uh, like, long-term question. I think that um, anti-Semitism has been a feature of Western society for basically as long as it's existed. Um, I think it's 
these types of accusations, while what you're quoting is certainly happening, I don't think they're mainstream even today, um, but they certainly are there and they have been for a long time. Um, they, I, don't know, I think one way of thinking about that so, some scholars have written, including my advisor at University of Chicago, um, David Nirenberg, so he's written how often uh, Jews in the abstract have functioned as a way for Christian society to figure out like what it believes and like Jews as, in the abstract fun function as the other, right? Like when Shakespeare was writing Shylock, there hadn't been Jews living in England for 400 years. Why, why did he think of Jews as this like um, vilified uh, type of character? He hadn't even met a Jew. He hadn't, there hadn't been Jews there for 400 years. But um, I think just the function of the Jew in Christian society um, changes based on what else is going on, but it, it's an easy, like, other, right? It's, it's a good way to have someone to, to think through the challenges that they're going through and kind of um, label things that they don't like, um, right? The same way that, like, Jews are accused of being, like, globalist, uh, I don't know, like, um, on the one hand, like, these, like, globalist uh, people who, who believe in, um, that versus like communist, right? Like, how, how can they be both? Like, those are opposite. Um, but I think it's just for some reason that has been a way that uh, Christian society has thought about Jews, and um, in in some corners still does. But I think it has definitely receded a bit since like the times that we were talking about. But there's certainly a lot to talk about in that realm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, I think I have to run in like a minute. But again, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to email me. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Thank, thank you. Kelly. <laughs>